like to introduce our next segment of the day, which is a panel on collective impact. In line with our theme of disrupting the boundaries of social impact, collective impact is an approach that breaks the mold of individual organizations working in silos to address problems in a community. Instead, collective impact unites organizations from different sectors to work together to solve a specific challenge facing a community. Today, we have a fantastic panel of leaders in Chicago that are currently engaged in a collective impact initiative called Thrive Chicago. I'd first like to introduce our moderator for the discussion today, Brian Battle. Brian is a principal at Civic Consulting Alliance, a Chicago-based consulting organization that partners with business experts and government officials to make the city of Chicago more livable, affordable, and globally competitive. Brian leads CCA's education practice and is currently overseeing his organization's work with Thrive Chicago. The Thrive Chicago initiative seeks to create a true cradle-to-career continuum of services for young people in the city. Brian has over 16 years of experience in both the public and private sector, and he is also a proud Kellogg alum. Thank you for joining us today, Brian, and now I'll turn it over to you to introduce our panelists. Thank you, Angelo. And thank you all for having us here this afternoon to talk about one of our more exciting initiatives here in Chicago. Uh, certainly has occupied a great deal of our collective time over the last 18 or so months. Um, very briefly, as Angelo said, I'm with the Civic Consulting Alliance, and as a small management consulting firm, we do pro bono work for the city of Chicago and the county of Cook to help them with education, health care, economic development, and public safety. We deliver our services pro bono, leveraging our own internal talents as well as the talents of the major service firms, consulting, law, sign, et cetera, um, around the city to bring about $15 million worth of pro bono work to the, the efforts of the, our clients. Um, we got involved with Thrive about 15 months ago, 13 months ago, um, as there was this notion of this collective impact and cradle to career thing that was talked about at the city of Chicago without um, necessarily a strategy to go forward with it. And so we have been helping them with the various elements that we'll talk about today um, and certainly looking forward to uh, then sharing with after our guest talk um, with you, your thoughts on the topic. So first, let me introduce our guests. Uh, to my left, Pranav Kothari is the Senior Director of Strategy and Innovation at Strive Together. Um, he is the, uh, Strive Together is a subsidiary of KnowledgeWorks that's based out of Cincinnati and is in many ways the architect of this approach to collective impact in the cradle and to career continuum. Um, Pranav previously was with uh, Mission Measurement. Um, which is one of the leading organizations to applying measurement and program evaluation, practice evaluation uh, in the education space. Um, in the past, he has uh, he's also served as a guest lecturer here at Kellogg um, and has his, uh, his education background with an MBA at uh, Michigan Ross and prior to that, his degree in, from Washington, Lewis, uh, Washington University in St. Louis. To his left is Molly Baltman, who's the Assistant Director of Grant Making in the Communities Group at the McCorm Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Um, McCormick, the McCormick Foundation is one of those wonderful foundations, appropriate we're in the room that we are. Um, <laughs> it's known for ha getting its hands dirty in efforts in Chicago, and Molly is very much at the pointy edge of that spear. Uh, for not only do they, um, do they generously gift to these various efforts, uh, but Molly and the organization at the McCormick uh, will be taking on the sort of fiscal sponsorship of the Thrive Chicago effort as it makes its transition from the mayor's office where it has been, where we have been helping, to where it will spend the next couple of years as it develops. Um, Molly has uh, her bachelor's from Michigan State and her master's from the University of Chicago and has worked on the government agency side of the fence and with the Illinois Department of Children and Family Services as well as with uh, other multidisciplinary um, Collective Impact works at uh, Archworks, um, which is a Chicago-based uh, nonprofit with, and design educator. Finally, to the her left is uh, Paige Ponder. Paige is the Chief Executive Officer of One Million Degrees. One Million Degrees is an organization which helps thousands of low-income uh, students who are high energy, high potential in the community colleges uh, systems to achieve, you know, great to go on to achieve great things. Um, her programs are outstanding. Her uh, scholars graduated three times the national average and go on to far more successful experience at their four years uh, programs in the work or in the workplace. 
Uh, Paige has a fantastic background as it relates to this. She comes from the public school system, spent a great deal of time in there developing pathways uh, for the students that have come out of the public schools and into their, their post-secondary lives. Um, Paige is a member of the Thrive Chicago Leadership Council, has been involved from the very beginning at the behest of the Deputy of Education and the Mayor's Office, um, and as well as serves in some of the more tactical roles in what we refer to as our change networks, which is where the actual work gets done on the ground. So we have a lot of expertise there. So I'd like to thank all three of you for joining us and spending a little bit of your very busy afternoons with us. Um, so first, I'd like to spend a little time, Pranav, if you would, to describe from the Strive Together perspective, uh, the notion of what is this cradle to career continuum, what is collective impact, and what is this approach that Strive Together brings to the table? Sure, thanks Brian. Thank you all for being here, and uh, thanks to Kellogg, and uh, thanks to Angelo for uh, coordinating the panel. Um, so the overall premise of the cradle to career pipeline and this idea of collective impact started about 10 years ago um, in Cincinnati, Ohio, where they were trying to solve a very specific problem. Um, they are very interested in getting more uh, students, particularly those from the local public school districts, uh, to enroll in and then complete college, uh, four-year degrees specifically. And what they realized is that there were not enough kids even getting to 12th grade who were prepared for that option. Um, so they were either dropping out of the system before that or when they got to, to high school, uh, they didn't have the either academic or social supports, um, et cetera, or the financial supports to be successful in higher education. So what that led to is um, a long conversation throughout the city around how do we actually align all the resources across the cradle to career pipeline, so that entire education continuum from the time that you're born through the time that you go through middle school, high school, into higher education, into a career. How do you align all those uh, organizations, programs, schools, uh, et cetera, so that you can actually hit the outcome? So we actually increase the number of students who are coming through the uh, pipeline prepared for higher education. And that was the whole concept of cradle to career and why that, why that piece is there. Now the collective impact component, which was that term was coined by uh, the folks at FSG, um, but basically what this is is how do you coordinate all the resources around a particular community so that you can hit an outcome. Um, so in the case of Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky, which was the original Strive partnership, it was how do we get more kids basically to and through college. Um, and that was the entire idea where you align the early childhood system, the public school districts in particular, where the majority of the students are enrolled, um, the higher education system, and ultimately the workforce, uh, so that everyone knows exactly what the expectations are, what outcomes we're kind of trying to hit, how do we actually look at data then in the community, say where are students falling out of the pipeline and how do we fix that, um, and ultimately, again, uh, increase the number of students who are coming out prepared for, for college and higher education. Um, so this work has now grown um, sort of into a bit of a beast across the country, I'd say, um, where the term collective impact is used fairly loosely, I would say. Um, but Angela's definition was at its core right on point, where it's a group of organizations across and uh, who are trying to solve a specific problem in a particular community. Um, and the work that we're doing at Strive Together now is very much focused on how do you bring quality and rigor to that process. So it's not just another collaboration, another set of meetings, another effort to hit a particular outcome in a community, but a really thoughtful way to build what we call civic infrastructure so that this work can sustain. So 10, 20, 50 years from now, the entire system, the entire education system in a local community looks different. Um, and it actually looks like a system that's equitable, serves all students, and actually consistently produces uh, increasingly better outcomes for all kids. Thank you. So if you could elaborate a little bit on the origin of the relationship with Strive Together and the city of Chicago and how that came to be in, in the sort of early days of getting the initiative off the ground. Uh, someone from Mayor Emanuel's office called and we came running. That's <laughs> <laughs> uh, kind of how that works sometimes. Uh, well, so Strive Together, we're a national organization. We're working with 53 communities across the country now um, around this work. And really the premise was, I think there were folks in the mayor's office who started looking at this work and saying, hey, we think there's a model here that, or an approach here that could work in Chicago. Um, and so really our role then became as a strategic advisor, similar to CCA, around what does, what do the early stages of building collective, a collective impact cradle to career community look like? Um, and for us, it was a huge learning opportunity because it's by far the largest city we've worked in. Um, there are about 400,000 plus students enrolled in CPS 
um, which is by far the largest city partnership we have. We have some geographies that are larger from a student population, but they're working with 15 districts or so. Um, so really our role then becomes as strategic advisors and coaches to the folks at that time in the mayor's office um, who are actually trying to coordinate all the organizations, um, do things like identify common outcomes, identify common indicators, figure out how we're going to get the data, identify what these change networks are to figure out what are we actually going to start working on. How do we actually get a group of organizations together to start moving and improving K readiness, early grade reading, middle grade math, et cetera. So our role was really to bring our past experiences at Strive Together and from these 50 other communities across the country to the work in Chicago, um, but then really focus on building capacity locally with the team to uh, implement our theory of action. Thanks. So Molly, if I can turn mm -hmm. to you, sure. from the philanthropic community, it seems to me that there is a great deal of excitement and energy. A number of major philanthro uh, philanthropic uh, organizations have come to the table, uh, both committing financially, but also committing their people and their time, and a lot more than just dollar interest to this. Can you reflect for us a little bit on what is different about Thrive, or from where that excitement comes as the, from the point of view of a funder? Absolutely. I'd be glad to. And thank you um, as well for the invitation to be on the panel, and Angelo and the great group that coordinated this. So we are jazzed about mm -hmm. collective impact. We are so excited. And uh, Admittingly, we it took a little while for us to get on board um, when the whole idea that when the article came out and, and um, when FSG published this article and using Strive as a, a case study, we thought, you know, this is this a consultant that's just naming a term and this is just something that's been done before. No offense to many of the consultants in the room. <laughs> I have many friends none, who are consultants. <laughs> <laughs> so you know, it's really I mean, a lot of this work is is people have been working on collaborations in the past. It's not a new it's not a new term. But the, there are very distinct differences about collective impact. And as a funder, our whole goal is social impact, is really measurable results. We want to know that we are making very smart investments. And we are approached by many organizations that have very innovative ideas, very good ideas, tackling the same issue. Sometimes folks will come together around from different sectors and say, we're going to work on the same issue. And that's really exciting. What the difference is, is that there's a common agenda. There are common outcomes. There are common goals that everybody's coming together. The egos are set aside as much as possible. We're still working through all of this. But the idea that there would be one, what, what is coined as a backbone, that is really managing all of these relationships and having people from different sectors, the business community, the public sector, private sector, small nonprofits, this is something that is really exciting. And it's actually challenged us as funders to work differently. Uh, we have a reputation for being very siloed. And that is a, a, a big downfall of the philanthropic community. We don't always work together. And this is a community-driven effort that we can be a part of, but also respond to. And we're going to have to change some of our behaviors as well. We're going to have to change some of our behaviors and working closer together on what kind of outcomes we're asking our grantees for. We're going to have to do some co-funding more than, more than we had um, done in the past, most likely. Um, we're going to have to change our expectations a little bit. This is really going to take time. And it's an investment in a long-term process for multiple people to come together around common, common outcomes. So we are completely on board. We're actually um, not only supporting Thrive here in Chicago, but we're funding a couple of other communities that are starting up these efforts. And we're helping drive down that path with them hand in hand. We're excited. Great. Thank you. Um, so Paige, as I turn to you, and I do so realizing I forgot to introduce the most important part of your background, and that you are also a fellow Kellogg alum. So <laughs> wonderful, to, uh, wonderful to have that perspective. As, but as you think, you've seen a number of efforts over the years, from Chicago Public Schools to here, and your role at One Million Degrees, to address some of these key uh, milestones or the you know, outcomes, as Prana put it, in this cradle to career continuum. Um, a number of rally cries, whether it's from City Hall or from other centralizing bodies. But this one is another example where a lot of providers or, or service providers, nonprofits, and networks are coming to the table. What is the draw to this initiative rather than the perspective of, oh, great, here we go again? Right. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so I spent um, a number of years at CPS and was part of two different initiatives um, at Chicago Public Schools. 
One was around the dropout crisis, um, which was our attempt to kind of extend something that the America's Promise Alliance had, um, had begun in terms of a cross-sector um, way to, to address the dropout crisis. And then another one around out-of-school time, which was the Wallace Foundation had given these huge grants to cities to build collaborative infrastructure around out-of-school time. So there was a common database and some common um, training and uh, methods and vocabulary around what really good programming in out-of-school out of time looked like. Um, so one funder-led, one sort of CPS-led, um, and it felt like chasing a windmill, right? Because there was just, it was such a heavy lift and really difficult from within CPS to get something like this off the ground because, um, oddly enough, not everybody trusts you when you're coming from CPS <laughs> to, um, to really be capable of doing this. And I think the difference is that um, what I finally came to with the dropout one in particular was, um, I mean, if you have money, then you can get some stuff done for at least a period of time, right? If you have no money and also um, you don't really have an executive sponsor like the mayor, so I finally came to, you know, this is not going to happen until the mayor says, I want this to happen. And in other cities that have done um, this kind of work around the dropout crisis, Philadelphia comes to mind, it really was the mayor championing this and people came around the table. So when Thrive started to kind of happen and it was coming from the mayor's office, I thought, now we might have a chance and now this actually unifies all of these various sort of attempts at collaboration that um, had happened in the past. That's great, thank you. So I'm going to come back to Pranav if I can, and I think as we talk about Thrive Chicago and Collective Impact, there are a number of different elements to it that we've set up along the way to make it work. And on the one hand, it's the, the backbone organization, as described by Molly, which is bringing together the efforts, uh, organizing the, the, the work that needs to get done. Um, and then there is this notion of data and measurable outcomes, which we'll talk more about as well in a minute. But at the heart of it is the work. It's the work, as Paige describes it, where there are groups of these disparate organizations coming uh, together to do something different, um, to take on a problem in a different way or to take on a different aspect of a problem. And at the end of the day, that's where the rubber meets the road. That's where the progress uh, happens. Otherwise, it's just sort of a fun academic exercise. Um, in the approach, in the Strive Together approach, and as we've which we have largely adopted, not completely adopted here in Chicago. Talk to us a little bit about how we hold or how organizations who don't report to one another, uh, for as much as one million degrees uh, and the mayor must work together, Paige doesn't report to the mayor. So how do organizations hold one another accountable or how is accountability put in place so that progress is made? Yeah, so let me describe sort of what would happen in the old world of in a, in a community where there isn't a collective impact effort and how we hope it works in the new world. So imagine a community that has, say, 50 or 60,000 students in their local school district. Maybe they have 20 college access programs that exist in the community. So these are out-of-school programs that provide college advisement, scholarships. Maybe they help with financial aid form completion, et cetera. So each of these 20 programs are doing all their own fundraising. They have their own management teams. And they're all trying to say what they realize come December, January of every year is like, oh, we need more kids to complete their FAFSA forms, right? Their financial federal, uh, their federal student aid forms. So they all cook up their own genius ways to do this. Um, and they all probably have independently pretty interesting results, right? Well, we had 40% completion rates last year. Now we have 60% completion rates. What we're trying to do in this work is to get those 20 organizations to say, hey, across all of our programs, we are probably reaching or have the opportunity to reach all the students who are in this school district, all, or all the seniors at least. What if we actually coordinated and said, we will together focus on this common outcome of improving FAFSA completion rates. We will collectively set a target for we want 90% to be complete by, say, February 1st or February 15th or something. And we put our best brains together to figure out how to get that done. So instead of me running my program, Molly running her program, Paige running her program, Brian running his program, we say, and we all say, we all do this together, and we say, okay, where are places that make sense for all these students to get together for these completion events? Where are places where we can actually, where, how, how do we verify the data with the feds to make sure these are all completed? 
et cetera. So the whole idea here is to say, well, we're all doing a lot of the same stuff. We're all <laughs> driving at a lot of the same outcomes. We probably have some version of the same target. We should be a lot more coordinated on, on hitting the outcome. And that's where the big push of the work, frankly, is. Um, but what, what that gets to to Brian's question is now how do I hold Molly responsible and accountable and Paige and Brian and myself? And what, what the, the mental model we use here is we, we try to put the student at the center of all this work, right? So instead of this being about my Pranav's College Access Program or Molly's College Access Program, it's of the 50,000 students that are in our district, of all the seniors, how many of them are completing this FAFSA form on time? And that becomes our priority. So all of a sudden, the adults, frankly, fade to the background of the conversation. The students come to the forefront, and that's the outcome that we all care about. So all of a sudden, we're not saying, well, my program did a great job. Your program didn't do a good job. Collectively, how did we hit this 80% number? And that's, frankly, the driver. So it does take a little bit of trust building. Uh, we often say partnerships move at the speed of trust in our work. Um, until all of our programs start trusting each other, it's hard to get there. And it takes a few reps. Um, and frankly, it, it maybe takes for some programs to fall out of the partnership, and that's okay. Um, but then the whole idea is if we put the student at the center of this conversation, all these adult issues around who takes credit, who's responsible, who, who's accountable, kind of fade to, the, fade to the background because we're all concerned about whether or not we're hitting the student outcomes. Great, thanks. So Molly, I want to go back to this discussion we've had on outcomes. And as we'd said before, one of the things that was central to the way Strive Together talked about the effort and the work was focusing on data. And McCormick, I know, in many cases, I've, in some cases I've been in the room, McCormick's involved in a lot of different efforts and initiatives and often uh, specific to data and how and how data is used to evaluate and measure and look at the efficacy of a program. If you could talk a little bit or break down a little bit from your perspective the role that data plays in this and how it plays out and how McCormick plans on using it. Yeah, absolutely. This is, I think, the most exciting, well, there are a lot of exciting things about this, but I, I'm so jazzed about this data aggregator and the idea of using data as the central piece of um, the collective impact initiative here in Chicago. So the McCormick Foundation, as many foundations in social investment, um, venture capitalists, everyone is looking at results, right? What's our return on investment? And so we've had many uh, initiatives where we're working with nonprofits to try and build capacity around collecting data, not just having it be funder driven, but what data they, do they want to know? How do they know if they're making an impact? And how does that data that they use actually improve their program services. And we've been doing it pretty siloed in each kind of our, our issue areas that we fund in. And the biggest, one of the biggest barriers for CBOs to be able to get data, especially academic data, is getting it from CPS, you know, getting it from the schools. They either have to go through many hoops of getting parents to sign off, getting report cards, and the pressure that we put on them as funders to get this data to show how their intervention is making a difference is takes up more time than it actually takes to run, this, run the programs. And when we found out about what was going on with the, with the data aggregator, is that the name, the official name for it, or is there a new? Uh... I'm sure there's something far more clever than that. Okay. But might need some branding. <laughs> yeah, really exactly. Cool. Maybe got one any of you will be ideas deciding on what it's called. Um, it's the idea that um, all of the, the data from CPS will be able to be available to the nonprofits and in a, in a confidential way, which the attorneys have, have figured out. And I think there's a student here that has um, also helped with some of that social return on investment. I can't remember where he is right now, but right there. all right, all right, <laughs> very cool. But the idea that um, organizations will be able to see, particularly the students that they're working with in their out of school time programming. What the, what the academic rates are, what the behavioral um, um, uh, suspensions, um, you know, any type of um, tracking that CPS does that will impact their work and what they should be working with the kids on. And so if there's a soccer program, an after school soccer program, they're going to be able to see their child that they're working with. Are they also involved in another nonprofit literacy program? Are they getting tutoring? What, what, is, what, what are the other services that students are involved in? And they'll be able to be able to aggregate that data with their student, the students that they're working with, but also be able to use that to make decisions on how they're actually going to intervene, how they're going to do their tutoring, how they're going to do their student support work. 
So the idea that we will be able to ask our organizations for data that they have and that they are able to use to be able to um, not only report to us, but that they can keep and figure out what's working and what's not and learning from other organizations as well of what they're doing is, is, is groundbreaking. It's really, really, really fantastic. And so we're, we're super excited about it. Great, thanks. So Paige, I wanna piggyback onto a little bit of what Pranav was talking about with, and you alluded to in, in the, um, a few minutes ago with respect to the role of the mayor's office. And as a, I'm leaving the sort of provider perspective now to the leadership council and the role that you play there and has been a you know, vocal member of the leadership council where appropriate, <laughs> Um, we were having a meeting about this transition from the mayor's office to the uh, to somewhere else, and uh, it was Paige who spoke up about six months ago and said, "I think we know all we need to know. Let's make a decision." And so it was a, a very <laughs> helpful uh, to keep keep the work moving along. But if you could talk a little bit about this role, we've talked about backbones, we've talked about change networks. But what is this role of a leadership council, and, and talk about the that a little bit? Sure, and it's um, I've been honored to be part of it. Um, so this is the, I think, kind of collection of the champions of the work, the leaders of the, of the change networks, um, funders and other folks who are interested in supporting it. And the role, my perspective is the role has been to sort of guide the um, thrive in, this, in these very nascent stages um, to, to kind of figure out what, what is this going to look like? Where will it live? Where will it be housed? Who's going to run it? Who are the, what is the decision making process? Um, I think with the change networks there was the process of identifying what the agendas were in each of the, and so there's change networks around early childhood, around um, sort of elementary school and out of school time, around high school readiness, high school completion, college completion, and then workforce, just in case everybody, in case you needed to kind of have that laid out as we've been talking about Cradle to Career. So each of those change networks has a set of leaders. They've, they've created an agenda that these larger groups of folks have started to kind of coalesce around and start to really talk about the nitty gritty of, okay, so what does it really mean? Like for example, I'm in the Teal group, the, <laughs> um, which is the college completion change network. And we're talking about transition coaching from high school into college. So really working with students in those critical years to help um, inform the, uh, the college selection process and the college readiness process and then the retention and really making sure the train's on the rails when you're in your freshman year of college. Um, so, so there's folks who are at all of these different levels of the work, really understanding the, um, the work on the ground and then also thinking about kind of the political frame of it's great that the mayor has been a champion of this. That works both for us and against us in some cases and so there needs also to be a separation between the mayor's office in this work, and so how does that, how does that, um, how will that work? Who will receive it? And the McCormick Foundation stepped up to do that. So it's been a really, really interesting um, time. I think that it'll get even more interesting. And if I if I get to be part of the leadership council going forward, I mean, I think now once the data comes out, the real work begins um, because we I think need to come like there needs to be more of a meta strategy than I think there is right now. And really all of the kind of ground level work that's going on needs to come into uh, more of a comprehensive collective logic model. So what are the levers? We can't do everything. What are those levers that we can start pulling? Um, and so it'll be exciting to be part of that conversation as well. So if I can follow up on that and get back to something you said about the mayor's office. And concerns wise, as this initiative leaves the bully pulpit and this is a quite that pulpit. Right. What are the concerns you would have of this organization as it spins off on its own, becomes its own legal entity? Um, my concern always, because I, I now see, I was saying to Angelo that I'm so drowning in the weeds of my own organization <laughs> that I'm trying to grow, that um, it takes a, an effort for me to kind of pull my brain into more of a systems frame and I'm not alone that's that's all of us and so the additional time the additional investment I mean 
every moment I'm spending at a meeting um, for Thrive, I'm not raising money for my organization, is basically what it comes down to. And so that's a trade-off, right? Um, so I think I, those are the concerns that you know you kind of get through this honeymoon phase, and then people are asked to make trade-offs, either tra changing their approaches, changing their programs, sharing what they consider to be their own special sauce, you know, their competitive advantage that they've spent many, many years and lots of their time and effort, you know, creating, that's what makes my program special. Why should I now just give it to you because everyone says let's hold hands and, and do this together? <laughs> you can tell that this is really, like, these thoughts go through my mind, believe me, because I'm in the process of creating my special sauce, right? So th that's where the really hard work. Um, so I think it's also what is in it for each provider. So what is my incentive? to get on board, what am I gonna get out of it? And, and not just is it, I mean, money always helps, um, but is there, you know, can we actually make good on the promise of having a larger impact? Um, and so we need to move into sort of really the rubber meeting the road there and not have it be another set of meetings that just kind of go on into perpetuity. I couldn't agree more. <laughs> um, I wanna follow up if I may keep you, uh, I keep this with you for a second. We talked about what drew you, we talked about what concerns you had. There have been organizations that have not gotten on board yet. There yeah. are organizations that are sitting on the sidelines for one reason or another, mm -hmm. some of which we're very familiar with, but for the audience and their perspectives, what would keep someone from getting excited about a collective impact effort of this nature? Um, I mean, Short of the time. <laughs> the time. I mean, the time is such a real trade-off. I mean, we operate most many of us so lean that it's it's just insane and so the time is not an insignificant thing especially if in the conversations you feel like we keep having the conver same conversation over and over again um, then you're kind of like I gotta go do other things um, I think that you know there and I experience this at CPS a lot which is there's just the kind of like you know I've seen this before I'll see this again I'm just gonna kind of wait and see how this plays out and bide my time and either wait for it to go away or wait for something, for some real money to be on the table, frankly, from the, from the funders that are in the room, and then I'll, then I'll engage. Um, so yeah, I mean, we're, you know, running a nonprofit is running a, a business. You, you gotta bring the money in to pay the people who do the work. And as a CEO, I mean, that's my reality. And so, you know, we gotta get real with, with those kinds of things. Um, pretty soon. That's great. Yeah. So Molly, I'm going to kick it to you if I sure. may put you on the spot with respect to the concerns. Now I know McCormick has taking over the sponsorship of Thrive and sort of assuming that Backbone has no concerns about right, the, no concerns. the fact that this is going uh, <laughs> from the mayor's office to you. Mm -hmm. But um, if you could reflect on where you believe the areas of focus need to be to make sure that this is sustainable in the long, in the long run for the long-term change that uh, is needed for for collective impact to happen. Yeah, absolutely. We, uh, you know, we're we're excited about uh, supporting Thrive um, from the transition out of the mayor's office, and um, are also very happy that the mayor's office is continuing to be involved. So it's not something that the mayor's office is handing off and saying we're done. And one of the biggest reasons for that is. Again, I go back to the data piece, but the data piece is really big, and the mayor's office obviously has influence over what Chicago Public Schools does, and I think that's going to be a real key to the success. So we're very excited about that. Um, we also, you know, we were a little hesitant in the beginning because we don't we don't want it to be seen as um, one entity is 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 owning this, and McCormick Foundation as a funder um, has some <coughs> there's some power imbalance with funders and and grantees and. So we want to make sure, too, that we're seen as supporting the initiative, but it also is very much an initiative of many. Um, and so the, the, the pieces that I think in order for it to continue to grow is a lot of the trust building, a lot of, um, we actually need to get more uh, corporate folks involved. We need more, um, I think, more, more of the corporate sector and the businesses to come on board to say, we, we care about the pipeline of, of students that are coming to be our employees one day, and we need to get involved in, in that sense from an economic development standpoint. So there needs to be more uh, kind of recruitment and buy-in at that level. But also helping um, support the organizations with capacity building. Um, 
And as Paige had mentioned, it's it is it's it's a tight it's a tight rope that people are, are walking and Thrive could be demanding more on them, even in terms of, of data and gathering data. And so many of the foundations are coming around the table saying, how can we support many of our long-term grantees, not force them to be a part of this, but say, how can we help encourage the alignment, but also provide some capacity building support and um, be able to create their, these learning communities and such. So I think the 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 investment, the time um, is we that we still need folks on board, um, but it needs to grow even bigger. So that's what I would say. Mm -hmm. I think that's great. Mm -hmm. I think um, I think what's evident here is we talk about the last eighteen months. Uh, many of us, many of us, have spent a lot of hours on a collective impact, and as it's been described by Angelo and others here, it's not an insignificant volume of work, and it requires both being thoughtful strategic, uh, as Paige suggested, but then you know, rolling up your sleeves and making sure that the work gets done on the ground. And um, so and on reflection, I think it's an interesting point where we are right now. We're at a transition in the city of Chicago, um, and I mean that in the broad sense of the city of Chicago, more than the mayor's office, my client, um, as we make this new way of approaching helping age-old problems in the city and in the development of a youth uh, come to be. So. Um, we just need to check back in whether it's a year or what have you with this group and see how we're doing. Um, but I look forward to uh, hopefully seeing some of you out there in the space helping us make it work. So with that, I think we'll turn it over to questions. Hi. My name is Stanley. Thank you very much for a wonderful panel discussion. Um, I'm very seized by the term civic infrastructure. I really like the word in many respects. Uh, and my questions surround this concept, and it's directed to everyone in the panel. How, you know, we talk about so many different players trying to put things together, and, you know, then there's this concept of a civic infrastructure. I was just wondering, first of all, how do we make this infrastructure a lot more visible and tangible? Uh, and two, how do we build an infrastructure that survives some of the immediate stakeholders, you know, because, you know, mayor's office is going to change from time to time. So how do we do that? And then, you know, perhaps in, in the longer term, how do we account and justify for this infrastructure, particularly because infrastructure pay off many years down the road and some of the benefits is going to be emergent. So I was wondering if you could share some thoughts and ideas about this. Mm -hmm. Sure, so I'll start, and if you, if you all want to jump in. In terms of, I'm going to answer your second question first, in terms of surviving long term um, with respect to the mayor's office. And I will say that one of our very early hypotheses was this had to get out of the mayor's office as fast as possible. Um, in general, there is a cycle time to what is important to any political body. And in reality, this was a long term venture, and not typically the sort that survives uh, your sort of standard political uh, life cycle. Um, we knew that there was an election coming up, and you can never count on on that. And so, even though the you know the odds may be what they are, it's um, we, the thought was, in order for it to survive long term, it needed to do to get away from that influence. Um, but also, and I think it was Molly who mentioned that this was a community based effort first and foremost, and that the more that this was a part of what the community created, that, that it was something that the community would want to sustain. Um, and so if it was something that came down from the mountaintop, then it could be more seen as the flavor of the week that sort of more Paige referred to. So that's with respect to surviving in the long term. In terms of accounting for this, um, it's actually something that one of your classmates uh, here at Kellogg uh, took on for us over the summer. It's one of our summer fellows at CCA, was spending some time thinking about how do we put dollars to this in terms of the return? And we took, of course, a very holistic point of view. If you look at and describe in ways that matter more to the people in the space, the sense of, you know, there's lower crime. If people are educated, if people are in school, people are um, reconnecting with school and, and hitting that high school mark, getting through first years of college, getting through college, et cetera, that in general you're going to see improvements in every aspect of you know crime, healthcare, and 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 that sort of those sort of social 
benefits, but as well if you take a, a much more Kellogg approach um, and say, okay, well, if someone's a high school dropout, what is their likelihood to wind up in jail? Uh, what is their likelihood to wind up on social services? And as a result, a drain on, the, if you will, the, the, uh, the social coffers. Um, by contrast, if you get them a two-year degree, you know, they suddenly become net positive as they're now returning taxable income, they are helping bolster the, the, the environment around them, and then a four-year degree even more so, et cetera. And we spent some time taking really a first pass at what that model might look like. And we tried to look at it over time, and again, it speaks to the long-term nature of this model. So if I improve third grade reading and math, which we believe is a critical juncture point in the development of, of youth, well, it's a long time before I'm going to know whether or not they graduate high school. Oh, and by the way, at each point, life continues to be hard. So there's these, you know, if I get five new third grade reading and math ready students, how does that play out? So we have built and designed a model. It was one of the thing that, things that Paige and the group on the Leadership Council asked us to do, was come back and say, is this worth our time? And uh, the numbers suggest it's really worth our time um, initially. The question is there's some fidelity we're still trying to put to it. Um, as a lot of the research in this space is still a little fuzzy. Um, and, but again, one of your, your colleagues did a really bang up job and now the folks at Strive are taking this and using it as sort of a national basis for, for talking about this, but that's a big part of it. Um, in terms of visibility and tangibility, the last one, I'm really eager to hear what the other panelists have to say about it. But I think that it was our hypothesis early on to keep it quiet. Um, I mean, civic, civil infrastructure in general exists in sort of a just People know it. It's sort of like a you know, spider web we all live in. Um, you, you know, we were joking earlier. Everybody in education kind of knows one another. Um, they've either worked, you know, Paige was at CPS, so was this person, and now they're there in the funding community. And now Paige's got her own nonprofit. But the, um, in terms of this effort, we worked very, very hard to keep it quiet for a while because we didn't want to create an expectation that we were going to, you know, solve all this in the first year. And that was very much at the suggestion of the Strive Together Network. We are probably three weeks from the major sort of press release on this, um, saying that we've been doing this for the last year and change, <laughs> and um, we're pretty proud of it, and it's about to move. So um, we believe it's important, again, as an element of accountability, to make it visible, the effort and the work, and reporting on the numbers, reporting on the data, reporting on the outcomes. But you've got to be careful you don't suggest that you've got it all figured out until you're really ready to launch. That answers your question. I'm going to let the others take us. I'd, I'd like to jump in if I can. I think um, I relate this back to um, work that also went on at CPS around the freshman on track rate mm. over the last decade. Um, and what we found was that you have to have a very short iteration cycle for feeding the data back to people, right? So really, it will start to become the fabric of how things just work when, I think you said soccer coach, the, a basketball coach in Inglewood gets on the, the FAFSA completion bandwagon and says to his team, hey guys, we need to do this, here's how it's going to work, and then sees that they actually get more money and then more of them go to college, and, and really that very short kind of, if I do this, then this happens, and I'm going to keep doing that over and over and over. Um, and we need to be really thoughtful from the leadership level to think about what can we do in those very quick iterations. Um, because as, you know, the very long-term nature of it is you're going to lose people, right? And you, it's just not visible to any of us for a very long time. So we got to combine the long, the big picture of what is the, what is the return on investment um, in the long haul to in the daily lives of people who are actually touching the youth. How are they using this? And how are they feeling like they're accomplishing something by plugging into the infrastructure. Um, and the more we can do that, then, then we'll have some traction. I think our, our mental model for civic infrastructure is to surprise to what it exists, right? But the problem is that a lot of students fall out of it at various points along their education pathway. So ultimately, what we're trying to do is not build civic infrastructure, but build cradle to career civic infrastructure so that any student has multiple pathways through that process, through their educational life cycle. And should there be a point where there's a slip, um, there is something there to support and then enrich and then make sure they continue on. Um, and that's sort of the mental model that we, that we, um, that we try to put in place. And, and I can't say it exists anywhere that we're working now because we still know that there are students who are not being served well. 
um, and we still know we have education systems that are inequitable, and we still know that there are systematic failures for a lot of kids and a lot of families on a regular basis. So, but that's sort of, as we think about, may we need to be more inspirational about what it is or what the mental model is. Um, but that's what we're trying to get to, this idea that any student has multiple pathways and then any student, should there be a, a, a point where they're falling behind or slipping, that there's something to sort of propel them forward. I would, I would just add that the public-private partnerships have been something that we've all been trying for many, many years. And the difference I see in this is instead of a public-private partnership, because philanthropy can play a very small piece, right, in, in funding. I mean, that's just a fact. And so there have to be certain ways to plug in. The partnerships being so holistic and large um, and the accountability being at, at this level where everyone um, who is on board is, is looking at what the accountability is, I think does keep more pressure on the civic infrastructure because it's not just with that mayoral change. It's not just with this one system, but there are these nonprofits coming in, funders coming in, businesses coming in, and really it's exposed at every level. So that kind of exposure, I think, will hopefully have some kind of sustainability. had around um, this panel is, you know, you've each sort of um, named different challenges that you see in making collective impact successful. So it's trust, it's changing the funding model, it's, you know, trying to grow individual organizations. Um, and I'm wondering just in this process if there have been conversations around actually changing the infrastructure of, you know, the organizations, the nonprofit community um, about either formalizing, you know, not just partnerships, but actually, you know, combining organizations and you know, really thinking about changing that system. Mm -hmm. um, I come from that world, and I know that's a very difficult thing to do, um, but I'm curious in this case if that's been part of, you know, the conversations. I think um, it naturally is. So right now we have about 40,000 education nonprofits in the country. We spend uh, somewhere in the order of $600 billion a year in public resources on, on education, and we're dismal basically across the board on producing s systematic outcomes for kids. So basically, there are a series of, of um, breakages along that process, and I think one of them certainly is the way, and I, so I work for Strive Together, our parent company is a foundation, so I get to speak from both perspectives, which is really nice. Um, so I can be sort of hypocritical and provocative at the same time. Um, so from the funding model, like we, you know, foundations fund programs, right? Um, and as a program officer, you find really cool programs that you fund, and then you go tell your board, what an awesome program I found and funded, and look what great results they got. Um, but until that funding model, we have folks like McCormick and frankly what KnowledgeWorks does, they have a, you know, they've been investing in the Stride Partnership in Cincinnati since 2006. Uh, it probably wasn't until 2010, 2011, where we actually started seeing material improvements in student outcomes along each of those points on the continuum. So that's a really patient capital model. Um, and our, and our, our last speaker talked about that, right? You need really patient capital from the foundation community, from the public sector to say, these outcomes aren't gonna just real, you know, they're not just gonna happen. Or if they do happen, we're not gonna be able to sustain them over time under the current funding model. Um, so there is a lot of conversation and the way we talk about it, uh, and Paige alluded to this, so we focus a lot on con continuous improvement in our work. Uh, it's drive together, so it's about Small tests of change, get data back very quickly, figure out what's working. If it's not working, do something different. Um, but the funding community doesn't really operate like that because they have year-long, two-year-long grant cycles. And if you tell your funder, like, hey, this didn't work, so we're going to try something else, there's a whole rigmarole around changing your budget, what your project's going to be. So I think a lot of those mechanisms sort of create bad behavior for what we're trying to do. Um, so I think what we try to look at is let's fund the good practices rather than the programs. So our, in our collective impact communities, our job is not to employ people at nonprofits. Our job is to get better outcomes for kids. So whatever the path is to that, is, is, and it's about propagating really, really great practice around these outcomes that we care about. And if that means that some of the organizational structures will need to change, that's what has to happen. That's what has to happen. Last question. Okay. Um, thank you so much for coming. Um, I It struck me as really interesting that it seems like it's very costly for the first mover, whether it's from the funders or 
from the, yeah, from the funders or from the nonprofits to, to be the one to champion this idea. And yet it seems really necessary to have champions in order to get the momentum you need to have success with this. So I'm curious if you could speak to how do you find that champion and if you guys believe that you have that champion for, for this initiative. So I would, I'll start and you guys tell me where I'm wrong. I would say that a big part of it is what um, you know Paige brought up with the mayor's office. I'd also say that there was a personality at the mayor's office, uh, Elizabeth Swanson, uh, who some of you I know know, who was at the center of a lot of it. She had a lot of street credibility from having been at uh, Chicago Public Schools. She had um, spent time in philanthropy and now was in the mayor's office proper. Um, she's, you know, very, as a result of being familiar with the different ways that different, all the different organizations operated, uh, she could she could play that role of sort of you know you know rallying and drumming up enthusiasm even if she didn't have to get into the day to day work of of particular you know guts of things but was willing to do so where appropriate and I I'm, I'm, I know at least one of us on the panel if not well two of us are on the panel here today because of Elizabeth Swanson and and, and the work that she did there um, we've managed to keep Ms. Swanson involved even though she escaped the mayor's <laughs> office. Uh, she's going to be a part of our, our Thrive community for some time um, as it becomes its own legal entity and her role on the board for that. So I think, um, I think that's an important part of it. It's also, um, you know, I would say she very quickly drummed up the enthusiasm of the likes of, of Paige Ponder, of, of you know, Molly Baltman and, and uh, McCormick, you know, getting a couple other big champions from their respective communities who people trust and who people are enthusiastic to get behind. I think that's important. I think it's an as to to finish up is a part of where Molly referred to. We don't really have that corporate, uh, you know, that same corporate presence that you might expect. We have the philanthropic arms of certain corporations, Boeing and um, Microsoft stand out in particular. But um, I think there is still, uh, depending on you know, we look at long term sustainability and carrying the message forth, um, and in different areas of where we will work. That that a champion in that community is is yet to come forward. Um, and uh, as part of, I think, our work in the year to come to figure out who that should be, what role they should play, et cetera. But I don't know if your guys' thoughts on that. Yeah, I would say that the, I think a really a good thing that happened in Chicago, and, and mostly pr probably with Beth's leadership, was incorporating existing coalitions in part of this, um, this collective impact initiative. So, for example, the Early Childhood Learning Council was a very strong uh, group that was working towards particular goals and that was aligned with our cradle to career initiative so it's not that everybody's starting from scratch um, sometimes it's aligning existing activities in more of a kind of a streamlining those existing activities so hopefully that will um, create kind of that continued champions for that have been already going on for, for a long time um, and I think I think the leadership council is strong. I mean, Paige and her colleagues, and and our CEO is is all over this and is is willing to go talk to anyone about it. Um, and I think there are those key champions that have bought into a lot of because of um, Pranav and, and his team's work around educating us on what this takes. And so the leaders that have been engaged, I think, are going to stay there, and and um, we have hope. Thank you.